Iranian and Russian news censored in the UK by the Telecoms Cartel and Ofcom. Us cancelled off Bristol Community FM by the Bristol Mafia. And now from PRSC2 by the Trans Lobby. Uh, but before we talk about our cancellation, uh, I'm pleased to welcome Jude English, who's a former Green councillor here in Ashley Ward, right in the, in the ward itself. Uh, hi, Jude. Oh, hi. Hi, Tony. So could you just uh, tell us a little bit about what you first got you into politics and why the Green Party and when? That's oh, three well, questions in yeah, one. Yeah, three in one. Well, I've been thinking about this recently because it's funny when you get cancelled yourself from your own party. So 2006, um, I was... Um, I'd just finished a degree in environmental architecture and renewables and stuff like that, and I was um, thinking about the future, I think, and uh, Caroline Lucas became the leader of the Green Party. And I thought that was interesting because prior to that, they'd been leaderless. They'd been this kind of, you know, collective... They have joint leaders, don't they, or something? That, well, now they do, but at that point, there'd been no leaders. They'd just been spokespeople, principal spokespeople, and these were the, the top dogs, the show ponies of the um, very small and, you know, rather fringe uh, Green Party. And uh, so she became leader, and I thought, that's good, a woman as leader. And, you know, obviously she'd been you know, quite popular and um, well thought of. And um, the Stern report came out. I don't know whether any of you remember that, but it was a big and very important report by, um, I think he's Lord Stern now, and it talked about the cost to the whole world, but particularly Britain, of not dealing with the climate issue. And it was a very, very influential document amongst people who were interested in that sort of stuff. So I was moved to join a political party. I'd never been a member of a political party before, so um, I stepped into that place and thought, uh, there's my home, um, because I'm a deep, deep ecologist and, you know, interested in politics. What do you... Deep ecology, what's that? Ah, uh, well, the other thing that had happened to me at the time, I suppose, is that I'd... Um, been doing some um, other interesting work around um, transition, that are not transition as we would think about it today, but transition uh, peak oil and the transition to the, you know, the new world order. Well, how is the world really going to change from the modern industrial farmer state, you know, all the things that you, you, you talk about, and into this different world where we don't kind of kill the planet. Can I, can I try and simplify that? Because the way I think of it is just some sort of post-industrial... Yeah, yeah. You know, de-industrialisation. Yeah, degrowth, de-industrialisation. So the industry in this country seems now to consist mostly of office blocks with people yeah, phoning people up yeah. to bother them things that they don't want and not so much actually building anything anymore yeah so so there were these things going on i attended a really interesting course at schumacher college schumacher the um um the economist not the uh, racing driver um and rob hopkins who who's founded the transition movement had been there very influential um guy to me at the time and um there was quite a few people from bp it was a really fascinating um you know, an interesting diversity of opinions. And um, uh, so I was moved to join the Green Party. I have to say, for the first few years, I didn't really do much, like most people in the Green Party, just gave them some money and let them get on with it. OK, so you, then you, you stood as a councillor. Did you get asked to stand? Did you ask to stand? Well, I'd been quite... I think um, that was 2015. I'd been getting a bit more involved and um, I offered to stand in Lawrence Hill. Obviously, that was somewhere we had no chance in hell no. of getting anywhere. Well, I myself was a paper candidate like ah. that in Clifton. Yes. This would be around about 2004, five, something like mm. that. Did quite well. Mm. Uh, they were all saying, oh, we were surprised. I'm sure it was because it was me, not because yeah. it was the Green Party, no. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so Lawrence Hill. Yeah, Lawrence Hill, because... Um, well, I suppose I must have been late to the game, actually. And um, I dare say I know what it was. I couldn't stand in Ashley because they, they already had people oh, there. Okay. So, so I must have said, oh, well, I'll stand in Lawrence Hill and I'll have a go. Um, so I stood in 2015, didn't get anywhere, but um, did increase the vote and uh, worked jolly hard, actually. And then the next year, I think, um, Rob Breyer decided not to stand in Ashley and I put myself forward. It's an interesting ward, isn't it? Most people know it as St Paul's. Well... It's a bit wider than that. Oh, it's much wider than that. I mean, it's actually, I think, a little microcosm of the whole of Bristol, really. You've got St Andrews, the kind of posh bit at the top. You've got St Paul's. You've got Montpellier, which is, I don't know, used to be students and a little bit radical. I think we'd um, perhaps argue it's changed a bit over the last ten years. St Paul's, St Agnes, St Werberg's, of course. I mean, you know, so it's an interesting mix. Can you sum up your experience of being a councillor at the City Council? This is during the time where we had a mayor, isn't it? 
Yeah, so and the idea is the mayor kind of takes away a lot of the influence from the uh, the old councillors. We've now gone back to the councillor system. Yeah, Did you yeah. feel that you kind of turned up on to do a job which was almost redundant as a councillor under a mayor? Yeah, I think I did, actually. Um, the first four years with Marvin were interesting. It was a much smaller Green Councillor group, if you remember. It was about 11. We'd gone down. We'd lost a few. Uh, it was a kind of tight group. I'd say most people were ecological Greens, you know, interested in climate and uh, the Stern Report and things like that. Uh, not so much the social justice warrior type Green that we seem to be um, having a lot of these days. So the first four years, I mean, Marvin was a tough a tough leader. He was very, very authoritarian. Greens didn't really get a chance. Um, you know, the Green Party leader at the time was sometimes to be found crying. He made people cry. He was, he was quite, um, he was difficult. He was a bit authoritarian. And we didn't well, really have any power. What Marvin's kind of famous for is uh, when you ask a question, turning it, kind of throwing it back at you and saying, you know, basically not answering the question, but yeah. getting you to justify what, how mm. you dare to ask such a question. That's sort of yeah, I mean, I think there's two things looking back on it. People have got to remember, I think, that the Greens have moved to the place they're in now, 35, possibly 36 after the selection um, councillors, in a relatively short amount of time. So in 2016, we were 11. Um, and so yeah. a small group of 11, we weren't even the second party. So we were just doing that thing where you can say... Oh, we'll have a motion on this. We wish, we wish everything was green. You know, vote on that. La di da. So, um, and it was, it was more interesting in a way. I was the chair of policy, uh, place scrutiny. So that was the time of the arena. Oh, there was God. all the stuff over that going on. There was um, a lot of the stuff about the building and the university. So Marvin was controlling the whole agenda. A, we had a, do you remember we had a shared um, rainbow cabinet at the very beginning mm. with a Tory and a Green. He got rid of that really quickly because he decided that he had to have complete control and power. Um, so the first four years were quite, quite interesting. I think Greens were just kind of doing what Greens probably do over most of the country is like, you know, make a fuss about trees, make a fuss about this, whatever, not actually do any governing or any leading or any making decisions. So we weren't making any decisions at all. And then the second four years, obviously we had COVID, which is a real downer. And um, what happened there, I think, in terms of um, the council was very interesting. Um, you know, the, the whole of the council, the first four years, was very buzzing and full of people. But a lot of presence, you know. If you wanted to talk to a planning officer, you could go down the corridor and have a word with them. Yeah. Um, by the time we'd had COVID and everybody's been working from home, and even now I think if you go to City Hall, a real culture of absence. So people are working remotely. There isn't that feeling of um, collegiateness. There isn't the kind of sense of working as a team and i think that's been a problem for lots of workplaces but i think certainly it, oh. it, it was down at Cam it's, so it's actually really depressing to hear all this because you, you, you know I, i'm someone that worked in newsrooms in the 1990s busy newsrooms and i go into a newsroom today even up at the bbc it's quiet you know, everyone's sort of focused in the little workstation on their own thing and i rather like to be you know workplaces where People are maybe calling across to each other. That there's a sense of a bit of a buzz going on. Everyone's kind of pulling together. Um, but um, the, the, you, you've got to say something, I think, about the arena because this whole business has been such a sort of plague in Bristol. We were first of all told that this massive piece of land next to Temple Mead Station, that's where it was going to be. Uh, it was like pulling teeth to get everyone to agree to do it there, which George Ferguson managed to do. Uh, and then, while Marvin has appeared, we suddenly hear, oh, no, it's not going to happen there. That land is going to the university. Now, the university is just intending to build um, its own buildings for lectures and things like that on there, but also accommodation. Uh, the, the university seems to run the city now. It's almost like the student money coming in from the student grants um, – no, not grants, sorry, loans – uh, is the only thing that the city's economy can really, really rely on. Lots of developments happening because of it. But anyway, the arena, a whole arena idea, it hasn't even been started yet, is up uh, at the old Filton Airfield, which is way, way out of town, off mm. the tr transport hubs. And this just seems to be, uh, well, it's one of those decisions which is really about the university and about money much more than it is about where should we have an arena if we need one uh, which lots and lots of the public will go to not hardly anyone's going to go to the university site there 
Well, yeah, looking back on it, I mean, at the time, this is, goes back to what you asked me at the beginning about whether, whether the Greens had any real power. I mean, Labour had complete and utter power over the whole of that process, but the Mayor particularly, I mean, I think even the Labour backbenchers um, were finding it really difficult because you had your um, elite bunch of, say, eight cabinet people all being paid, oh, yeah. you know, over 30, That's 40, right, they get paid grand. extra, don't they? they which get paid makes extra. it a little bit tainted. It's like, well, if you agree with the mayor, he'll put you in the cabinet and you get paid more money. Well, I mean, that is what happened, actually, isn't it? If you think about it, he had, he had a couple, a Green and a, a Tory that he sat very quickly and then, then very quickly got a new cabinet, Labour cabinet, and then the ones who weren't yes men, like... Um, Mark, the guy who was the transport guy, um, Mark Bradshaw. Mark Bradshaw. Yeah. You know, if you didn't say yes, you were sacked, and then a new young thing, you young ish you think, would be put into the place. So it was definitely a feeling of that, but also the cabinet basically controlled it. So the cabinet of these eight people were making the decisions, and mm. Marvin was making the decisions, and behind the scenes, Kevin Slocum was also making the decisions. Oh, yes. So yes. I think the what you is say the PR guy. Is, um, that you look like you've got democracy with those 70 councillors, mm. but really you've got um, eight chosen Labour people with Marvin at the top making all the decisions, and that's really how it was. If you remember, we had a motion to council to have the arena in the centre. All 70 backbench <laughs> councillors, I think, voted for that, and Marvin overrode it. And that mm. was the problem with the mayoral system. Or you could argue, if you, if you were him probably, um, that was the advantage of the mayoral system yeah. that we actually got a decision i have to say looking back on those eight years and being quite critical of marvin a little bit you know the beginning about the authoritarianism and all the rest of it i can see now that it was actually a very difficult job to yeah. control that to make decisions and some of the stuff he would say to the greens about you know you don't have to make decisions you're not in power when when you are in power let's see how you do i think it's going to be interesting to see the next four but years we, what that looks the, like you know so you've been part of the kind of rise of the green party in bristol here now we've had uh, the, uh, back in may we had local elections the greens are now the biggest party on the city council in fact i think they were just before as well but they uh, but but you're not part of it why no not? no why not well i was cancelled i was cancelled tony um Interestingly, the parallel with what I've just talked about with the Labour Party, um, in the Greens, you kind of, you get that look of it being a bit fluffy and nice and whatever, but there's a controlling group in the Green Party, the Regional Committee, um, which has probably only got about eight people on it because they've bullied most of the other people off it, and they have the ultimate controlling sanction of suspension. So all it took was for one... Uh, colleague of mine to write a complaint to say that basically he doesn't like my views on sex-based rights and that i tell you what it's quite interesting the complaint says that my views are so um disreputable that um i was a danger to carla's campaign um i think most people would know that if you saw me around um St. Paul's or being a councillor, you wouldn't probably have a chat with me about the sex gender issue because it's not something that came up on the doorstep, not something that I made a big fuss about. But um, this was one guy who'd bullied me before, put in a complaint. His mate said, that's it, she's, she's suspended, which actually means expelled in this context, and that's it because there's no control and no discipline. So it was actually um, also, I think, you know, well... It was deliberate. It was deliberate. It was sabotage. It said Jude must not be allowed to be a member of the new administration, uh, must be not allowed to be a councillor. It must be a punishment. She must be made an example of. I mean, that's actually what it said in the, um, in the, in the complaint. Now, of course, it's shocking. It's really shocking, actually, because the Greens had already, last year, just lost um, a, a court case about discrimination. So you'd think they might have learnt something a little bit about what they'd done so wrong. Did you not think of, of or did you, could you, well, would you think about taking them to court over that decision? I, I indeed will be taking them to oh, court, Tony. Totally. <laughs> okay. So um, yeah. one of the reasons it's good that I'm here today is that yesterday, in fact, so I suspended just a few days before the nominations were due in. It was deliberate. It said she mustn't be allowed to be a councillor, so it's a definite... Because of her views, she mustn't be allowed to be a councillor. Not that I'd said anything nasty to anybody or done anything, you know, 
hit anybody. Can you, can you tell us what your views, so-called controversial view, is that will <laughs> bring the Green Party into the Are yeah. you allowed to repeat it? I think I am, because that, actually it's, it's quite interesting, isn't it? So my so-called uh, controversial view is the view of most people in this country, is that sex is a real thing, immutable, that's unchanging, and that women have the right to... Uh, freedom of association, freedom of um, speech, and uh, that we can have uh, same-sex spaces when appropriate. So those are not really radical views. In fact, everything, everything I would say is already the law, yeah? Um, and it's related possibly to the fact that I'm a lesbian. You know, this is the other thing. I think it was a homophobic attack. The guy who, the guy who sent in the complaint... Um, I mean, I do know who it was. It was anonymous, but it's very obvious who it was. Had already previously bullied me and called me uh, a Nazi, called me all sorts of names, and said, Tony, that I'm part of a group that believes in conspiracy theories. Uh, Martin, can I just bring you in? This is, sounds a bit similar to the, the things that have been going on in the Labour Party, doesn't it? Um, with, with Jeremy Corbyn, with people... Um, I mean, not just Corbyn, obviously, but very various people in the Labour Party being told that they're anti-Semitic. Well, it is. I mean, in a way, this is politics. I mean, this is what it's all about. The, the people use these mechanisms as a means of, of, you know, the Greens are not going to be, um, what's the word, they're, they're not going to be different from any other group that's, that's formed. The Labour Party has been full of factionalism in all my lifetime. There's been continuous battles. I mean, if you don't like rowing with people, you shouldn't be in it, really. I mean, that's what goes on. Um, but I think it is significant that the trans lobby has got such power because, obviously, per Stella Perrett, uh, who we're going to talk about later, I mean, she was removed from the Morning Star, having been a c cartoonist there for many, many years mm. for, for putting what was regarded as a, an anti-trans cartoon. And I think there's a, another element that strikes me about this is if we're going to debate these things, people have got to allow people to have different opinion. Mm. I mean, that's well, what, that's what I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not, I don't necessarily agree with those people, but I'm, I'm perfectly prepared to listen to what they've got to say. But you can't shut me up at the same time. That's not reasonable, is it? Well, this is the interesting thing, isn't it? And if I'm going to critically reflect, as, as, I, as I will... Um, I had been writing to the Chief Executive Officer of the Green Party for over 18 months saying, uh, well, actually in February 2023, I wrote a letter saying, I've been elected to be on the Green Party Women Commission a Committee, so that's a committee that's to do with women's rights. Well, I suspect that I will be maliciously complained about at some point in the future. So I'd like you to note my protected beliefs and I'd like you to make sure that if I'm maliciously complained about that you investigate properly and that you do something about it. So I'd yeah. already set this in February 2023 and then I wrote over 10,000 words of whistleblow to the same CEO saying a number of different things when different people have been attacked, when Alison Teal was suspended in Sheffield. So I've got a catalogue of all the things that have happened, not to me, to other people. So um, actually a part of the court case will be that I've been um, attacked and suspended and expelled for its victimisation. But the thing that I think is interesting, Martin, that you're saying is the Green Party is... It's kind of a, a, a toy political party, I'm going to say. It's a bit like role play. They're all playing at being politicians. Um, I agree with you that if you don't go into politics, if, if, you, if you don't want to be part of the rough and tumble of it, but what they don't seem to understand is that there is such a thing as factionalism in politics. Now, I think what you had in the Greens before, and I'd say even in 2016 when I was part of a nice, you know, green group, was a lot of people who agreed fundamentally that the planet's in dire danger, we need to do something about it, and what we're trying to do is to get political leverage to do that. But what we've now got is a faction, very strong faction, a kind of queer social justice faction that has completely taken over the party. But what's, and, and the party doesn't know how to deal with it because it's not got that long history of labour, of dealing with factions, having different sections, understanding that that's how it works. I just don't think it's there. That's partly what it's battling with at the moment. And what we're going to see, if I'm, if I'm going to reflect forward about what's happening to the Green Party, a big influx of new members, not all of whom will have their, their um, 
a view of all the Green Party policies, because some of the Green Party policies are absolutely nutty. You know, they really, really are. Uh, you know, they were put through when people weren't looking. And, and Give it an example or two. Um, or let me... Com- uh, <laughs> no, top of my head. Well, some of the ones on trans rights, actually, were put in in 2015, and I think now if we look back um, and, and had another look, people would say that's perhaps not what we're put in now. You know, no. actually- Isn't it funny? So a lot of these policies seem to have been brought in um, before people realised what the implications are. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on some of the other ones. Yeah. The stuff to do with sex work is work, to do with uh, prostitution. Uh, as a feminist and a supporter of women's rights, there's a lot of those, th- that side of things which I disagree with. I mean, and I've disagreed with for all the 16 years I've been in the party, but it's never been a problem because it's never been something that people really talk about. There's lots of stuff to do with consent. Uh, lots of that very, very progressive, very, very woke stuff that's in there. That's one of the reasons the Green Party is, at the moment, um, shut down its website so you can't see, you can't see oh, the policies. Right. Yeah, they took yeah? everything off, didn't they? Well, yeah. they've, they've yeah. made it, and that's because there was one on maternity, wasn't there, came up in the press last week where basically it was some kind of, um, we, we don't, we think uh, natural childbirth should be the, the only way forward. Well, there was and one about it. rationing meat and yeah, rationing dairy yeah. projects. There's another one, actually, about we shouldn't have pets. Yeah, it's funny because there's all these, pic- all these pictures of Zach Polanski and Carla and pets and dogs and all, isn't oh, it lovely? What a car crash. Is uh, obviously so, not a proper debate happening in this party. No. So you're not having a proper party oh, conference no, no. where these things are properly no. thrashed, thrashed out. No, and that's the issue, and that's one of the things that I've been talking to the CEO about, saying, you know, you can't... So they've tried to shut the Green Women's Group down from the very beginning, they just don't want women to speak. I mean, much more than in the Labour Party. At least in the Labour Party, you've got the Labour Women's Declaration, you've got lesbian Labour. They're allowed to speak. The Labour Party's not stupid enough to expel them because you're expelling somebody for their protected belief. I think the Labour Party gets it. The Green Party doesn't get it at all. Um, So, you know, no debate is the authoritarian issue in, in the Green Party. But what I was going to say about the factions is we've got loads of new members coming in, including a lot of um, Muslim members. So the Gaza yeah. thing has really, yeah. really made an explosion in Muslim members. Yeah. We've got a new Muslim um, special interest group that's just started. Yeah. Now, there will be clashes within oh, and God, factionalism yeah. coming up very, very fast inside the party because we haven't got this issue of free speech sorted out. You know, there will be Muslim men, um, like the guy who took my place here in Ashley, Abdul Malik, who's a, who's, a, who's a leader in the local mosque, who I'm pretty sure if you pressed him to say, you know, can a man ever be a woman, will you allow a trans woman into the male side, uh, you know, the female side of your mosque, is going to say, mm, that's not, not going to be happening. Yeah. But he won't be attacked because he's a man and he's a Muslim. Although, let's see, it's going to be an interesting thing, isn't it? As I said, Shara, Shara Ali the person who's just won the discrimination case against the Green Party is, of course, a man and a Muslim. Well, you, you, you asked, just before we came on air, we were waiting for Windows to do its updates. I was so sorry, everybody, about that. Uh, we were talking about this idea of n- no ri- rigour, in intellectual rigour in the party. And I, I remember, um, I can't remember the lady's name, but she was a physicist. She was the leader of the Green Group on Bristol City Council. Oh, Eleanor. Eleanor. Yeah. Chatting with her about 5G having I thought was going to be an interesting conversation about the idea that uh, mobile data was the policy, this is going to go forward into the future as the main way data was going to... And, and the differences between a policy around using things like uh, fibre to get data around, which uses virtually no energy, where 5G, where now, for example, in Ireland, they haven't actually got enough power to power all their data centres and their mobile networks. This is a massive issue to do with energy, and I would have thought this would be something that the Greens would be interested in. And I remember putting the question to her, and I just got a completely blank response, like, well, it's not an issue. But to me, this is the sort of thing that, you know, the Greens should be looking at. If you want to reduce energy, then you should be questioning... The, uh, this policy to do with the internet, well, do we want it all going through the airwaves, uh, which is a, takes 100 or more times m- more energy, or do we want it going in these little lines through the ground? So that's the sort of thing that I, mm. I was quite frustrated with back then, but I mean, you're saying that this is a wider problem in the party? Well, I think it's a very big problem. I think when the Greens took a turn a few years ago to go, oh, we're going to get involved in social justice and have all these other policies, so we, we look like all the other... You know, well, look, social justice is a basically yeah. good thing, isn't it? No, About it's a redistribution good, it's of wealth a good thing. and things like that. Yeah, yeah, it's a good thing. But um, I think 
what I would say, yes, lack of intellectual rigour. Let's take one of the reasons why I was cancelled and expelled. So I wrote something for a website called A Lesbian Perspective, and I talked about my deep ecology roots and how I'm interested in... Um, well, I'm an, I'm an energy scientist, actually, so well, let's go back to that. And I said, there's some rather strange um, views in the Green Party, including people who don't believe in uh, evolution. So, you know, if you, if you don't know a man and a woman and how dimorphic sex happens, you don't believe in evolution. Um, and I was a bit scathing about that. But I talked about the big farmer issue, how we don't seem to be understanding the connection between giving the, the green light to big pharma to, you know, use puberty blockers and, and all sorts of medical intervention on young people um, and the association with the massive, massive money industries. But also, I didn't say this in the article, but the only party that, the only thing that people think about when they think about radical new policies for the Green Party is, is universal basic income. I think they're always trotting that one out. Now, that's an old-fashioned thing now. All the other parties have got hold of it. What's the radical new view that the Greens have got on anything? And I think you're right. The, the energy issue, things like 5G, uh, data storage, data management and all the rest of it, we're not talking about any of that. We're not looking at anything future-proofing. There's nothing... If you said to me, who's the leading Green thinker on this sort of stuff in the party, I think you'd really struggle, you know. Well, it might be me, but they'd kick me out. But so, you know, there's no there's nobody looking into these things. There's nobody getting ahead of Labour. It's just it's just um, repeating the same old, I mean, old Mark stuff. Martin, isn't it just a simple thing that as the Green Party, people like Jude have put the legwork in to make it a credible force, certainly here in Bristol politics, as they get closer to power, so the lobbies move in and they say we don't want people like this around. Well, it's partly to do with the lobbies. It's also just you know, being in power. I mean, the Labour Party had a similar history a hundred years ago. But well, there's an element of control yeah. freakery here, isn't there? Yeah. We, you know, we have decided what the, what the direction of the party is going to be, and here's someone that's not singing a, from the same hymn sheet. Let's get rid of them. Well, I think there's obviously. I mean, obviously, what the, the Labour Party was never a Marxist party, but if you've got a theory like Marxist theory, people, are, you know, the, the sort of left wing politics I was involved in, you're expected to read these documents and understand what's in well, it. Well, it's a similar yeah, thing yeah. for the Greens, the kind of ec no ecology, of what side that re on. report you were talking about. You, you know, can't this just is make a, it up. Yeah, this, well, is, this is the this is where This is where I think I, I'm, I'm struggling with them, um, and possibly was even before I was um, cancelled, is that there is no intellectual rigour, there is no looking at any of that, there is no um, educational aspect um, to to why people join the Green Party. And what you've got now is people joining the Green Party from all four different directions. You've got people joining from the Conservatives, joining from Labour, joining from Liberal, and joining from nowhere. So they're going to have to face this really difficult um, balancing act, which they're also having to do at the moment, where they're fighting here against a Labour candidate and in Waverley against a Tory, where, you know, you've got to be actually quite a centrist party, yeah. although they're not. They're a very, oh. like, Marxist left-wing... You've got wing. to be a little offshoot of the Uniparty. Uh, that's yeah. the idea, I so, suppose. So I think that it's going gonna, it's gonna to trip them up in a few years because there's no um, intellectual core. Um, and again, isn't even, that part of the deal? You know, the idea is you vote for something, but you don't have to actually think about it. Well, I think that is what's happening. And look what's happening with this campaign in Bristol, which I have to say, you know, you've got to admit, the Green Party are running a very, very good campaign. Well, I'm and, getting something through my Bristol Central door every day. Well, so am I. I mean, I'm, <laughs> every I'm, single I'm, day. Another one. Funnily enough, I was talking to a poli saying uh, vote green. I was talking to a journalist from Politics Home uh, yesterday, and I said one of the things I'm really interested in is how they are paying for this. They the, if you just well, no, not how they're paying for it because they're using members' money, but yeah. how they are getting away with um, so much stuff. The number of Facebook ads and the number of stuff coming through yeah. the doors. If I was Labour, I'd be going, "Can we have a look at the accounts? Because they must be overspending on this campaign. I just can't see how they cannot be." But you know, that's well, they're, they're throwing everything into they it, throwing, and they probably win. I mean, we even had. I think it. yesterday's one was the funniest so far. It was I'm a doctor and a lady with a stethoscope saying, uh, "You know, I was uh, part of the Labour Party and I just found." I had enough of it. Uh, the Green Party are going to be really doing well for the um, uh, for the NHS and this sort of thing. So yeah. <laughs> I suppose they're thinking, well, maybe people will vote <laughs> Labour because they think Labour is going to be best for the NHS. But they've got a special th – today's leaflet is all about how, no, the Greens are going to be really good. But anyway, I'd like to just talk about briefly, not go into too much depth, about our being cancelled from um, the People's Republic of Stokes Croft. So I got a – an email on Monday, it says, Hi Tony, uh, from Chloe Slater, 
um, at prsc.org.uk, Chloe at prsc.org.uk. We understand it hasn't been too easy to share the space, that's the studio we've been using over the last few months. We appreciate your efforts to make it work. We also appreciate all of the work that you and Dave have done around the radio suite over the years, and we take responsibility for not pushing the radio further when you were willing to help us out. We've recently become aware of some transphobic material that was left uh, both in the leaflet box outside the studio and pinned to the board outside. You've been asked previously to be careful about the type of material brought into the building by you or your guests. We don't believe that you would have been unaware or just how inappropriate and offensive it would be to users of our building. It's vital we maintain an environment that welcomes all of our community, <sighs> except you, Uh, And we consider this an extremely serious breach of that trust. In light of this, we will no longer be able to offer you use of the radio suite. Please let us know when you or Dave would like to come and retrieve your equipment and drop off your keys. Uh, On behalf of PRSC Direct as well, the chair of the directors, uh, Keith Cowling's name is needed on here. Uh, I don't know if he wants us to repeat the name Keith Cowling as the chair of the directors of PRSC, Uh, but uh, it's quite uh, frustrating. What do you make of that, um, uh, uh, Jude? Because this, this, for us, this is... uh, I mean, I I know. I had to say when we went to pick our equipment up. Can you show us this leaflet? I mean, I hadn't seen a leaflet. Someone had left a leaflet behind. I hadn't seen it. So you don't even know what the crime is that supposedly has been committed. Well, that's interesting because that's kind of how it works, isn't it? So my crime apparently was um, um, running a webinar that was called uh, "Policy Governance and the Law in the Green Party," where talking to a barrister, I discussed three recent court cases where big institutions had been found guilty of um, discrimination because they'd called something transphobic when it wasn't, because there's a lot of this that goes on, isn't there? So um, that, was, that was the basis of apparently my, one of my crimes. But that, what that, that's doing there is, is just outright, outright discrimination, isn't it? And you said to me, Earlier, will I be taking them to court? Well, yes, of course I will. Yesterday, a free speech union sent the Green Party executive a very long and detailed legal letter explaining exactly what they'd done wrong. Because free speech in this country is, is, is a given, and you can't, you can't just say you had a transphobic leaflet and therefore we're sacking you. Somebody came in with a transphobic leaflet. But what do they even call that? Is it a Posey Parker leaflet? Is that what it was? I mean, what was it? I mean, it was, it was becoming awkward to share the studio with the uh, trans radio people uh, simply because we kept turning up and finding uh, that s- the stuff wasn't working and s- wires were unplugged and all this sort of thing. Uh, but anyway, I just thought it was a very unkind way to do it without even asking kind of for a discussion. But this is the thing, isn't it? Because um, interestingly, I was looking back at some emails today because I used to be on the committee, the same committee that sacked me. Uh, years ago because I've had various different positions in the Green Party. I've been on the regional committee, I've been coordinator of Bristol Green Party and I found an email from about 2015 I think that said, that talked about somebody we'd been having a problem with and in that instance there was stuff about um, I went to give a, have a chat with them we talked about how things could be made better, you know, this sort of thing and looking forward to now, thinking now what happens is, everything that happened to me for example, has all been done by email no human person has actually spoken to me Maybe it was a, um, AI bot that did it well it could well it could have been an ai bot for all the for all the care and empathy that went on then um, this is um this is the thing isn't it you, the people's republic to soaps Croft has always been for me a very kind of iconic and interesting organization and people look at stokes Croft, don't they and think that's part of the radical you know different whatever that is well they, they the, the famous thing was the bear they put up yeah. in the bear pit which was also a big advertising board uh, which was in the face of anyone coming into bristol yeah. pretty much around that area that got then taken down by bristol's uh, city council security people even though the the, the prsc were people were supposed to be create uh, curating it uh, and but then i mean the the presence in the city has kind of gone downhill the, i know there was all sorts of threats by the council to impose full business rates on them and this was used as a sort of bargaining chip i think over a period of time uh so the idea is look we won't impose full council uh, full business rates on you uh because you're a um voluntary organization basically a charity you know well they were, they were certainly not a big they're not a business 
Uh, but, or maybe they are. Uh, but, but anyway, they have now, first of all, they got rid of the founder, Chris Chalkley. He was moved out of the way and had a mental breakdown as a result of that. He was the people that put Guy originally invited us in. Uh, and then also other staff who were very sympathetic to what we were doing were also disappeared, maybe just purely naturally. But it's become something else. It's become almost uh, like difficult to, 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 to say it exactly, but something has gone, something has been lost from from the place but i think that's what we that's kind of one of the things we're talking about here soul it? maybe it soul. is to do with soul so i suppose that's really to get back to the other question about when i joined do you believe the in evolution party. soul <laughs> <laughs> but there's something isn't there about being uh, able to have a conversation with someone you disagree with about yeah, having a rigorous absolutely. conversation yeah. about political discourse about intellectual discourse and saying you say that i say this there's something about compromise which is really interesting isn't there which is you know with the new makeup of the council um, how do you get a compromise decision or a consensus decision when you've got um, a huge green group, a smaller Labour group, you know, um, the tiny Tories that are left and a few, there's a few Liberals hanging on, isn't there? When, when you know, because you look at that and think there's supposedly going to be consensus, but every single committee will be uh, heavily weighted to the Greens. They won't, they're not good at listening. I'll just say that, you know, let's say so they're not good at listening to other people's points of view. It's been made really obvious to me. And so how do you get any kind of um, actual intellectual movement forward or thinking about the best ideas? I, I can or, remember, um, uh, I think it was a Russian newspaper article talking about President Zelensky uh, saying that he it was like getting on with him being in charge of ukraine it was like getting onto an aircraft with a guy who's dressed like a pilot uh and he's got all the right jargon that a pilot says uh but he's actually never flown a plane and he's just about to fly you so it's like people who are who are in these political positions but actually they don't really they're in there for a what it, you know, whether it is that they, they, I mean, it's a bit someone like Biden, you know, who's who's just going to follow a script. Someone like Starmer is going to follow a script, but they're not really, they're not actually political leaders. They're almost like actors in that role. So is it? I mean, okay, you, you might be having a go at the Green Party one step too far here, a, a bridge too far, but do you think that that's what we've got in the Green Party too, uh, as well as some of the other parties, leaders who are just there reading a script rather than leading? Um, sadly, um, I am going to say yes. I think at the moment that is what we see. I th it's interesting, isn't it? What, what, what makes me sad at the moment about this is this whole, we're the party that does politics differently. We're, we're all about hope. We're all about change. We're all about listening. We're all about whatever. But inside, it's not doing that at all. So at the moment, you've even got this going on at the top of the party. You've got Carla Denya saying all this stuff about hope and, and all the rest of it, although but knowing very well that women are being expelled from the party, people are being treated badly, we've got a really big problem with retention of um, members of the party who aren't white. You've got um, a lot, a lot of problems, but I think there's something about um, you can only rise up in the party if you've got a certain set of beliefs and you can only be given the huge amount of, of help and support. It's cost hundreds of thousands of pounds to get Carla into being an MP yeah. next week. And so she's the chosen one. And then from that moment on, I'm, I'm not even sure there's a script. I think it's about, uh, it is about playing a part. But one of my criticisms of the party has been that we've got, we had Carla and Adrian, the leaders of the party, but also the MP candidates. So the leadership part has just been completely lost. They've not been leading. There's no leadership going on at all. All they're doing is being MP candidates and, and show ponies for the, for the oh, organisation. This is so depressing. Uh, even the new up-and-coming parties are just as bad as the old ones. But is there any hope, do you think? I mean, the, the, can you the, see anyway? I mean, it political uh, for politics in Britain. I, I don't know. I think it's uh, it's a I, week to go before the vote, or little bit less, isn't it? You know, hopefully this is where we get rid of the those uh, intru in, intruders, uh, uh, imposters, and we get a few human beings in charge. I don't know. It's interesting, isn't it? When you look at the state of British politics at the moment and think, are we just swapping one terrible lot for some people who are slightly better, and then? then you've got, oh, well, let's have the slightly better people and let's have three or four Greens holding them to account. Now, what, what, part, what person thinks that four Green MPs inside a you know, huge Labour majority is going to hold anybody into account? Couldn't hold Labour to account when we were, <laughs> when we were here on a local authority. So I, I don't know. I think 
personally, I think it's really interesting looking at um, reform. I know people are very critical about the whole, you know, that it's just a it's just a private business and it's run by one guy. But Farage is a very, very charismatic and, and I think intelligent bloke, actually. I know he's a horrible piece of work and all the rest of it, but he's he's not being taken seriously enough by by the opposition. I think it's very, very dangerous to see what's going on. I mean, the state of British comedy is very sad at the moment. And I think one of the reasons is that the only really good... Uh, stand-up comedians now seem to be the likes of Farage. Actually, George Galloway does it as well sometimes. And some of the fringe political figures uh, look better because our stand-up comedy, you know, generally, at least on television anyway, is so awful. Anyway, so at least that you think, do you think there's any light at the end of the tunnel, finally? Um, by light at the end of the tunnel? Uh, I'm, I'm... For, for Britain, you know, for our politics, for Westminster, uh, for... <sighs> policies for decision making for the planet for the for the ukraine war which seems to be on the horizon no i don't think i do i feel quite despondent about it really to be honest at the moment it's like where is where is the hope i mean it's very well it's all very well to put loads of leaflets to the doorstep saying you know vote green and there'll be hope yeah. but for me it's like there's got to be delivery i can't see where the delivery is coming from we're, we're voting for these parties aren't we Actually, we we're not voting for the people who yeah. are going to represent us. We're voting for a party. Isn't it party politics? Maybe that's the problem. Well, I think th it is the problem. And in fact, you know, the whole the whole system we've got is based on, well, you said it before we were on air. It's big business that controls the politics. Yeah. And that's the problem. Yeah. Now, when I was a Green, I would have said, well, that's one of the reasons Greens are different, because Greens aren't controlled by big business. But of course, they are just in the same way. It'd be interesting to see how long it takes the Green Party to change its rules to say we will accept donations from business. It can't be far away before they go, we're missing a trick here, we need to get bigger. We're going to say, you know, Dale Vince, please give us some money instead of giving it to the Labour Party and be much more aggressive about that. I don't hold out much hope, actually. I think the political system is absolutely broken. Martin? Well, <clears throat> I think it's... The, the, you are, we are where we are. Oh, uh, come on, you can't no, say that. No, I'm going to say you <laughs> no, can't I mean, say I, mean, that. I know it's a cliche. <laughs> it but is we are, broken. We are, it, it is yeah. broken, but it was broken in Northern Ireland in 1969. It led to a war with all sorts of death and destruction. Two Tory, um, two Tory prime ministers were nearly killed. And at the end of it, it was resolved. And, it, and the, 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 one of the things we are lacking is PR, which is exactly what was necessary to bring the two sides together in Northern Ireland. Because mm. previously, it was a gerrymandered system the nationalists could never get anybody elected. When they went out and protested about it, they were shot down and then they took up arms. And that is, this is the danger, because we're going to go into the biggest economic crisis of our lifetimes very shortly. And if we don't get our politics straightened out by listening to All everybody, right. we're going to end up with okay, a civil so war. Okay, so let's just give the final word to Jude on that. Oh, no, I'm going to agree with you there. Yeah, we do, we do need PR. That'll bring with it a whole different set of issues yeah. and, and problems. It's, that not a, it's not a solution. It's just a necessary it's thing. A, it's a change. Um, but how is that going to happen? Um, Keir Starmer said this week he's not going to do it. Um, and the Greens, for example, are, they don't make that a, corner, a cornerstone of any of their political messaging. You won't find that in any of these leaflets that are coming through the door for this election. So, you know... Are, are Carla and Adrian and the other Green MPs going to hold the Labour Party to account over that? Well, they can't, can they? So we know that Labour doesn't want to give away power. That's one of the things Labour's been very, very good at over the years. You know, they're an old party and they know how to do it. Greens, Greens look at Labour and, and think, well, we'll learn the same tricks. I mean, they're turning into the Labour Party in a lot of ways, you know? Same, yeah, same I'll, I'll the answer to that is in Northern Ireland there will always be PR in the elections to the Assembly because that's one of the things that's absolutely central to the Good Friday Agreement, mm. and in Scotland, and in Wales, just over, in, over, yeah. the, over the river. And that means that, there's going, there's, that Britain is, is, is in the same... I used to be an aid worker in Yugoslavia in mm. the 90s. It's actually a multinational state. And if... The, it, I mean, of course, because it's been run by this, uh, you know, conservative bloc in England, because of, because of first past the post, we've had all sorts of decisions which, would, which most people didn't agree with, mm. rammed down their throats. Most people in Scotland are absolutely appalled with everything that's happened since 1980. And, of course, at some point, that turns into, like Slovenia and Yugoslavia, we're one out of this. 
Look, and that can then lead to, as in the Ukraine and lots of other places, it can lead to, to violence. Well, from what you're saying, you'd think that, we, you'd think that Starmer would say that, that within this parliament I will, I will bring PR in. So no, why is he not doing it? He's not doing that because he doesn't, and for the reasons you said, they don't want to give up power. <laughs> but they may be forced to give up power. It's quite possible that the Labour Party, for example, are going to lose seats on their left. Uh, in Scotland, you know, the, the, you know, Starmer's position on Gaza has gone down like a lead balloon in, pl in places like Scotland. That's not what people think. Mm, yeah, I and mean, I think he made a really big yes, misstep. Yes, a very uh, big definitely. misstep. It's one of the reasons I think Thangham is going to lose here is because, um, yeah. you know, Greens played a clever move with suddenly going, you know, well, we're going to make that forefront of what we campaign against. It's not just against. a clever move. If you think about the history of Bristol West, now Bristol Central, it was a Labour, solid Labour stronghold, Jer uh, Valerie Davy was mm. the MP, and she had been a CND supporter and so on. But in the run-up to the Iraq war, she didn't vote for the war, but she didn't vote against it. And the kind of people who live around here weren't happy with that. Mm. And they voted Liberal Democrat yeah. as a way of punishing their own... Yeah, yeah. You know, there's a radical vote in this constituency which isn't, doesn't belong to any party. Mm. As you can see what's happening in Brighton, where the, the Greens have been in running the council and, and having Caroline as the, as the MP for years, it looks as if the Labour Party might take that Green seat. That's interesting because... Because, of course, they've been yeah. running the council for such a long time, everybody's fed up with the... Well, with, they did, they messed this up and they messed only, that up. Yeah. Only it's, it's, the votes are just about voting voting somebody out. That's yeah. all we're well, giving. That's what first past the post is about. The one that they're most worried about, my internal, my moles in the Green Party, because obviously I still talk to people inside it, say that they are very worried about Brighton. Of course, that is, that is what's happening um, there is voting out some, you know, it's, yeah, it's, a, kick the rascals it's out. a punishment vote. And over here it's the opposite, in a way. It's interesting, Thangham came, kept, her, kept herself away from Marvin, I think, but it's been... It doesn't matter, does it? She's tainted. Well, she's by done some terrible things, like not turning up for hustings and things like that. Because she doesn't. Well, want Marvin, to, yeah. incidentally, men mentioning him, when Corbyn put himself forward and has made the, the you know, the, the candidates of the left, uh, Marvin, uh, all the Labour MPs in Bristol were totally opposed to Corbyn. They didn't want Corbyn. They campaigned against him. They were unhappy that he he, he managed to be the leader. But Marvin took the position as I'm not taking sides on this. I'm the mayor of Bristol. I'm, you know, and, and therefore, I'm perfectly happy to work with Jeremy well, Corbyn. He knew, he knew that, uh, that that Corbyn's cards were marked. He's not going to. Well, no, I think I think in actual fact, Marvin's got his own political yeah. calculations running in his brain. You know. Anyway, um, he now he's what's his job now? He's going to be. He's going to be an environment. He's going to be an honorary environmental honorary he's be an honorary professor on I building monstrosities. He's honorary professor on building monstrosities. No. Anyway, look, Jude, thanks ever so much for joining us. If you, any people want to follow what you're up to, are there good places online to find out what's what's happening with your case, etc.? Well, I suppose I've got a tiny Twitter account. I'm okay. such a, I'm such a, such a uh, ter terrible risk, you know. I've got a Twitter well, account of about 1,300 followers. Um, but there will be stuff coming out. There will yeah. be a crowdfunder. I'll, I'll let you know, Tony, when it's um, so when where, it's up. where can we find you on Twitter, then? Uh, Jude Brew, at Jude Brew. Um, and if people want to look at the background to all of this, there is something called the Green Women's Declaration. It's a website, just look it up, Green Women's Declaration. We've got a list of all the people that have been expelled, all the laws that have been broken, the reason it's a copy, there'll be a copy of my complaint up there because I've made my complaint not confidential Good. because I want everybody Good. to see what a complete yeah. load of um, nutters they are. And the Free Speech Union letter that went out yesterday is, on, is pinned to the top of my uh, Twitter account, and that's a very interesting document. They've been very, very helpful, I 